Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you all. Please be seated. Thanks for having me. I am honored to be at the National Renewable Energy Lab, which will be henceforth called NREL. <laughs> we, uh, I have come today to discuss unbelievable opportunities for our country to achieve a great national goal, and that is to end our addiction on oil. I know it sounds odd for a Texan to say that, <laughs> but I have spent a lot of time worrying about the national security implications of being addicted to oil, from, particularly from parts of the world where people may not agree with our policy our, or our way of life, and the economic security implications of being hooked on oil, particularly since the demand for oil is rising faster than the supply of oil. And any time that happens, it creates the conditions for what could be price disruption and price spikes at home are like hidden taxes on the working people of our country. And so we're here to discuss ways to achieve this really important national goal. And there's no better place to come than NREL, and I want to thank you all for hosting me. I appreciate uh, all the... I really appreciate the scientists and uh, dreamers and, more importantly, doers who work here to help us achieve this important goal. I recognize that there has been some uh, interesting, let me say, mixed signals when it comes to funding. Uh, the issue, of course, uh, is whether or not good intentions are met with actual dollars spent. Part of the issue we face, unfortunately, is that there are sometimes uh, decisions made, but as a result of the appropriations process, the money may not end up where it was supposed to have gone. I was talking to, uh, talking to Dan uh, about uh, our mutual desire to clear up any discrepancies in funding, and I think we've cleaned up those discrepancies. My message to those who work here is we want you to know how important your work is. We appreciate what you're doing, and we uh, expect you to keep doing it, and we want to help you keep doing it. I, um, I want to thank Dan. He's, uh, he's going to be saying some stuff here in a minute, so we're not going to just going to thank him. Uh, I want to thank your staff for hosting us. It's a pain to host the president. <laughs> but anyway, you've done a fine job. <laughs> I want to thank the governor of the uh, state of Colorado, Bill Owens, for joining us. The United States Senator, Ken Salazar. Thanks for coming, Ken. I appreciate it. The congressman from this district, Bob Beaupre. I appreciate you being here. The congressman from the adjoining district, Mark Udall. Mark. There you go. Thanks for coming. We got all kinds of people. We got the mayor. I appreciate you coming. Mayor Barrick, thanks for coming, mayor. Just fill the potholes. Yeah. <laughs> You got a great city. Thanks for having us. I appreciate the State House folks, Senator uh, uh, Andy McElhenney and Joe Stegall, Stengel from this district. I think that's right. Appreciate you coming. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Good to see you. I want to thank the directors. Uh, thank everybody. Uh, so the challenge is what do we do to achieve objectives? As we set goals, so what do we need to do? What do we need to do as a nation to meet the goal? How can we fulfill our responsibilities that really say, we understand the problems we face, so here's what we need to do. Uh, first, uh, we need to make sure we're the uh, leader of technology in the world. I don't mean just you know, relative to previous times in American history. I think this country needs to lead the world and continue to lead the world. So how do you do that? One, first, there's a federal commitment to spending research dollars. In my State of the Union, I called on Congress to double the research in basic sciences at the federal level. 
This will help places like Enro. It will continue this grand tradition of the federal government working uh, with the private sector to spend valuable research money in order to make sure we develop technologies that keep us as the leader. In order for us to achieve this national goal of becoming uh, less dependent on foreign sources of oil, we've got to spend money. And the best place to do that is through research labs such as NREL. Now, we also got to recognize that two-thirds of the money spent on research in the United States come from the private sector. Okay? So it's one thing for the federal government to make a commitment of doubling the funding over a 10-year period, but we got to recognize that most of the money is done through corporate America, through the private sector. And one thing uh, that seems like a smart thing to do for me is to make the uh, tax rules clear. The Research and Development Tax Credit expires on an annual basis. It doesn't make any sense to say to corporate America or the private sector, plan for the long run, but we're not going to tell you whether or not the tax code is going to be the same from year to year. And so in order to encourage the two-thirds of the investment in the private sector necessary to help us achieve national goals and objectives, one of which is to stay on the leading edge of innovation, is to, is to have the research and development tax credit a permanent part of our tax code. Now, in order to get us less addicted to oil, we got to figure out why, where we use oil, and that's pretty easy when you think about it. We use a lot of oil for our transportation needs. And, um, and so if we can change the way we drive our cars and our trucks, we can change our addiction to oil. And laboratories such as this are doing an unbelievably interesting work on uh, helping us change our, the way we drive our automobiles. And you're going to hear some interesting discussion with people who are on the front lines of these technological changes. Uh, just I want to tell the American people three ways that we can change the way we drive our automobiles. One is through the use of hybrid vehicles in Congress. Uh, wisely increase the tax credit available to those who purchase hybrid vehicles. Notice we're trying to increase demand for hybrid vehicles. We can get up to a $3,400 tax credit now if you buy a hybrid vehicle. Hybrid vehicles are vehicles that use a gasoline engine to help charge a battery. And when the battery's charged, the battery kicks in. And if the battery gets low, the gasoline engine kicks back in to charge the battery. It's a hybrid. It's uh, there's two sources of power for the for the engine. The new technological breakthrough, however, is going to be when we develop batteries that are able to enable an automobile to drive, say, the first 40 miles on electricity alone. Those will be called plug-in hybrid vehicles. And yesterday I was uh, at, a, uh, at Johnson Controls, which is uh, one of the private sector companies that are developing the new technologies to enable cars uh, to be able to uh, not need the gasoline engine to, to charge the battery. Now that saves a lot of, you can begin to think about how this new technology is going to enable us to save on gasoline use, which makes us less dependent on crude oil, since crude oil is the feedstock for gasoline. The idea is to have an automobile, say, that can drive 40 miles on the battery, as I mentioned, but if you're living in a big city, that's probably all you're going to need for that day's driving. And then you can get home and plug your car right into the... Uh, right into the uh, outlet in your house. This is coming. I mean, we're close to this. It's going to require more research dollars. The budget I submitted to the Congress does have money in, in it for this type of research for uh, uh, new types of batteries. But I want the people to know we're close. The hybrid vehicles you're buying today are an important part of making sure you save money when it comes to driving. But they're going to change with the right research and development. Technology will make it so that the hybrid vehicles are even better in getting us uh, less addicted on oil and making it good for the consumer's pocketbook. Secondly, there's a fantastic technology brewing. I say brewing is kind of catch on words here. <laughs> called ethanol. I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of folks uh, in the Midwest driving, uh, using what's called E85 gasoline. It means 85% of the, of the fuel they're putting in their cars derived from corn. That's, that, that, this, is, uh, this is exciting news for those of us worried about addiction to oil. I mean, you grow a lot of corn, you're less dependent on foreign sources of energy. Uh, using corn for fuel helps our farmers and helps our foreign policy at the same time. It's, 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 it's a good deal. The problem is we need more sources of uh, ethanol. We need more, we need to use different products than just corn. Got to save some corn to eat, of course. 
corn flakes without corn. It's kind of... <laughs> Uh, and so one of the interesting things happened in this laboratory and around the country is what's called the development of cellulosic ethanol. That's a fancy word for using switchgrass, corn pro or, uh, wood products, uh, stuff that you generally you know, allow to decompose to become a source of energy. And as our fellow citizens begin to think through whether or not it makes sense to spend research, imagine dollars on this, on this technology, imagine, uh, you know, people in the desert being able to grow switch grasses that they can then convert into energy for ethanol, for the cars that they're driving there in Arizona. I mean, all of a sudden, the whole equation about energy production begins to shift dramatically. And we're going to hear a lot about uh, cellulosic ethanol. Finally, hydrogen fuel cells. It's, it's not a short-term solution or an intermediate-term solution, but it's definitely a long-term solution. Uh, it'll help us achieve grand objectives, less dependence on oil, and the production of automobiles that have zero emissions that could harm our air. And we'll talk a lot about hydrogen fuel cells. Finally, I do want to talk about technologies that will enable us to change the way we power our homes and businesses, which is the second part of the strategy, the Advanced Energy Initiative strategy. Now, first of all, there's huge pressure on natural gas. People in Colorado know what I'm talking about. Uh, we've been using a lot of natural gas for the uh, for the generation of electricity. And we've got to change that. Natural gas is important for manufacturing. It's important for, uh, uh, it's important for uh, fertilizers. But to use it for electricity is causing enormous pressure because we're not getting enough natural gas produced. One way to relieve the pressure on price is to uh, expand the use of liquefied natural gas through new terminals. And I want to thank the Congress for passing uh, uh, you know, new siting rights in the energy bill that will enable us to have more uh, terminals for us to be able to receive liquefied natural gas from parts of the world that can produce it cheaply, liquefy it, and then ship it to the United States. But the other way to take the price off of gas is to better use coal, nuclear power, solar, and wind energy. Now, when you hear people say coal, it c causes people to shudder, you know, because it's coal, it's hard to burn it. But we have got, uh, we're spending about $2 billion over a 10-year period to develop clean coal technologies. If technology can help the way we live, technology can certainly help change the way we utilize coal. And it's important that we spend money on new technology so we can burn coal cleanly because we've got 250 uh, years' worth of coal reserves. One way to take the pressure off natural gas is to use coal more efficiently. We, we believe by 2015 we'll have developed the first uh, zero-emission coal-fired electricity plant. We're making progress. We're spending money. Research is good. The American taxpayers have got to know that by spending money on this vital research that we're going to be able to use our abundant sources of coal in an environmentally friendly way and help with your electricity bills. Secondly, uh, we've got to use nuclear power more effectively and more efficiently. We had not built a plant since the 1970s. Interestingly enough, France has built uh, a lot of plants since the 1970s. They get about 85 percent of their electricity from nuclear power. And technology has changed dramatically. And I believe we can build plants in a safe way and at the same time generate uh, you know, cost-effective electricity that does not, the, the process of which won't pollute. And so we've begun to, in the energy bill, begun to provide incentives for the nuclear power industry to start siting plants. It just doesn't make any sense to me that we don't use this technology if we're interested in becoming less dependent on foreign sources of energy and we want to protect our environment. And finally, solar and wind technologies. Uh, we are, uh, we're also going to talk about that. NREL is doing a lot of important work on solar and wind technology. The, the, the vision for solar is one day each, each home becomes a little, little power unit unto itself. That photovoltaic uh, processes will enable you to become a little power generator. And that if you generate more power than you use, you can feed it back into the grid. Uh, I was yesterday in Michigan and went to uh, United Solar, and they've got some fantastic technologies. Dan was quick to remind me others have fantastic technologies as well. <laughs> I just hadn't seen them firsthand. <laughs> but the American people need to know with additional research dollars, which we're proposing to Congress, we're close to some important breakthroughs to be able to use this technology to, to, help, folks, uh, to help folks power their homes by the sun and finally wind. 
you know, we, we don't have a lot of turbines in Washington, but there's a lot of wind there, I can assure you that. <laughs> but there are parts of the country where there are turbines. They say to me that there's about 6% of the country that's perfectly suited for wind energy, and that if the technology is developed further, that it's possible we could generate up to 20% of our electricity needs through wind and turbine. What I'm talking about is a comprehensive strategy. In other words, we're not relying upon one aspect of renewable energy to help this country become less dependent. We're talking about a variety of fronts. And we're willing to work with uh, both the public sector and private sector to make sure that we achieve breakthroughs. And I'm fired up about it, and so should the American people be. I mean, we're close to changing the way we live in an incredibly positive way. And therefore, I want to thank the folks at NREL for being a part of this. Uh, exciting movement. I, I, it's got to be pretty interesting to be one of these guys working on how to make switchgrass go to fuel. I mean, it's, uh, it's got to make you feel good about your work because you're doing the country a great service. And so with that in mind, I've asked uh, uh, Dan Arvizo to join us. He's the director of the NREL. That means he's the, that means you're the boss? <laughs> Only part of the time. Only part of the time. <laughs> Until I get home. Why don't you tell the folks? Uh, yeah, well, smart man. Uh, why don't you tell the folks uh, uh, what you do here, okay. so people can understand? Well, thank you, Mr. President. I, let me first say, I, I uh, on behalf of the Department of Energy and the many uh, dedicated men and women at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, we're just absolutely delighted that you're here, and happy to host. And, and it's a great honor and privilege to have you here. And appreciate your leadership. Thanks. Thank you. I also, also wanted just to, to, to tell you that the Advanced Energy Initiative, which you, which you are now uh, very much uh, promoting, and, and it's a tremendous opportunity, uh, shows a serious commitment to um, technology investment, technology R&D. And it's, of course, a message that resonates with all of us. We're all, you know, gainfully employed in this, in this community. But uh, I wanted you to know that um, this resonates very loudly with us because there is a tremendous amount of opportunity. Innovation, creativity, pent up. People here are anxious to serve their country in this way, and it's a tremendous way to make a, to make a living and, and to do something useful in the process. And that trust that, that, that those resources will, will, uh, that have been trusted to us, uh, we want to make sure that you know that, we're, that we'll not mis that's not misplaced trust, the one that we're very, very important to. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that, that on the, uh, in the mission space that we operate, which is renewable energy, energy efficiency, there are tremendous breakthroughs going on across the spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, the technology areas, everything from solar to wind, biomass, um, hydrogen, and, and, and to a large degree uh, the, the technologies that will serve our country in the, into the future. Um, we think we can make some serious uh, inroads into how we use energy both domestically and globally, because this is a global problem and we would certainly understand that. Um, our laboratory is unique because our mission, we were created for the purpose of moving technology in the marketplace. And uh, one of the things that we've had to do as a result of that is, is partner with the best minds in industry and in academia so that, so that essentially we could uh, move that technology more quickly. And, and it informs our research agenda that it's market relevant, that businesses can be created, that, that jobs and the economy can grow as a result of it. And as a result, uh, you know, a number of the, the, the folks around this table, in fact, are great partners, certainly DuPont and, and GM and Excel and, and others have been in uh, lots of small businesses which uh, find their way into taking these technologies and moving it into the marketplace. Um, you had a chance to, to, uh, to visit with me at the, the National Bioenergy Center. Uh, tremendous progress being made there. The, the advances that you spoke about in cellulosic ethanol. Why don't you tell people the advances that are, that are being made? Well, the, the, the main thing that, I, that I'm mostly uh, incredibly proud of is the fact that with our partners Genencore and Novozyme, we've taken uh, enzymatic enzymes that, that essentially hydrolyze, and that means to break the molecules that are part of the plants and break them into simple sugars, uh, that, that technology of the last four years has come down from almost three to five dollars a gallon down to 25 cents a gallon so that we can begin to think about ethanol at about a dollar a gallon, which is a tremendous uh, advancement. And from, and from that breakthrough, your initiative on the biorefinery bioenergy has in fact now taken hold and we're starting looking at how do we get cellulosic bio, uh, ethanol in, in, in production yeah. in large I scale. I think what he's saying is one of these days we're going to take wood chips, <laughs> put them through a factory, and 
it's going to be fuel you can put in your car. That's absolutely uh, Is that right? That's absolutely true. Stuff that would normally... <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference between a Ph.D. and a C student. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> One of the other areas that we're, that, we're, that we're tremendously excited by is photovoltaics. You, you mentioned yeah. the photovoltaics. Explain what photovoltaics are. I, I threw it out there as kind of, you know, showing off. But <laughs> tell people what it means. Seriously. Photovoltaics is, is uh, actually the direct conversion of sunlight to electricity through a semiconductor material. And it's essentially what, you, what we use in, in computers for, for chips uh, that, we, that power those things. And, and to a large degree, it, it's a technology that's been around a long time. But uh, it has become uh, much uh, closer to commercialization now and in high-value markets. Uh, it, is, it is commercial today. And, uh, and, 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 in, and I'm sure Patricia will talk about uh, the Excel uh, uh, program that's looking at how that photovoltaics can shave the peak of our electricity demand right. and av allow us to avoid um, building new power plants to, to serve those peaks. And so even though it, it's at this point still a little bit more expensive than your conventional uh, technology, it in fact is, is something that, that has great promise. And the solar uh, resource is so ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Um, 25 years ago, I started working on first-generation solar cells. And um, in, that, in that time period, I've watched that technology be today's commercial technology. And now that I'm at NREL, we're overseeing some absolutely phenomenal science and technology in photovoltaics, I recognize that the future is incredibly bright for solar. And, and we will have... The, That's our, a good way to put it. I, and and <laughs> our... when the sun is shining. <laughs> And I am confident that we, it won't take us 25 years, yeah. as it did last time, to get that technology. See, what's on. changed is the global supply for uh, fossil fuels is outstripping the, uh, the global demand, is outstripping the global supply. And so you're seeing a price of the feedstock of normal energy going up and technology driving the price of alternatives down. And that's why this is a really interesting moment that we're going to seize. It's, uh, it's changed a lot of thinking. The price of natural gas and the price of crude oil has absolutely made these competitive, com competitive alternative sources of energy uh, real. And the question is, do we have the technological breakthroughs to make it uh, such that it can get to your gas tanks? Yeah. And, and, and just finally, I'd like to just say this advanced energy technology uh, initiative is absolutely uh, the right investment at the right time. There's, again, a tremendous amount of science and technology at the ready. It needs to be harnessed with our partners in the private sector and let those market forces pull this stuff yeah. into, the, into the business community because that's really where the investments have to be made. Good and enough. so where I understand about, you know, policy always being one of those uh, very uh, complicated issues. I, I like the Tom Clancy quote that says, um, if, if the, the difference between fiction and reality is that fiction has to make sense. And uh, that... <laughs> That can actually be applied to the way we sometimes yeah. administer our policy, but I, I, I do believe that it is an opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to get us to the next stage. I, and, and it's really important, I think, that the technology be a piece of that. Thank you, sir. Right. Larry Burns, why don't you explain to folks what you do for a living? Well, I'm uh, responsible for research and development and strategic planning for General Motors. Great. I've been doing that, uh, working for General Motors for 37 years, actually. 37 years? Yes. I started out of kindergarten. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> You're obviously not in politics because your hair is not gray. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. I bet you people don't know this. A lot of people don't know. There are four and a half million automobiles on the road today that can either burn gasoline or ethanol, called flex fuel vehicles. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that, that, People don't know exactly that. Right. In other words, the technology is available. Yes. Pick it up from there. I'm trying to give you. A... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's a it's a great opportunity to be here today and talk about both ethanol and hydrogen. You know, GM in 1999 started building flexible fuel vehicles. In when? 99. 1999. Yeah. yeah. And the reason it, it is is because ethanol... Tell people what a flexible fuel vehicle is. Yeah. What is it? Tell them what it is. Yeah, what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a vehicle that can burn both gasoline and E85 ethanol. As you explained, it's 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline. Right. So any mixture between gasoline and E85, the vehicle can burn. 
and in fact, E85 burns cleaner and yields higher horsepower than gasoline. It's renewable and it can be homegrown. So we think it's an ideal fuel. Does it for cost vehicles. much? Uh, well, from a cost standpoint, to make the engine. No, no, Plus actually, fuel. actually not. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward thing for us to do. The fuel injectors in your engine have to be changed. Yeah. Uh, but this is one of the reasons we can do it on high volume and give our customers the choice for. No, was this time. isn't something that's going to have that's going to be real expensive to the consumer if somebody wants so, a flex no. fuel vehicle. No, not, not in terms of the vehicle. We have a million and a half vehicles that we've built since 1999, and they're on the roads in all 50 states. We're building another 400,000 this year, uh, so we're pretty excited about its potential. And, that volume is important because like any new technology or fuel, if we don't sell it on high volume, it's not going to have a very big impact. Correct. One of the ways we've really embarked on making consumers more aware of E85 is a campaign that we just launched here as part of the Super Bowl and the Olympics called Live Green, Go Yellow. We're giving it a lot of exposure. What we're doing is we're making a, putting a badge on every one of our E85 capable vehicles that says Flex Fuel, and all of the gas caps are making yellow so that when the owner goes to buy fuel, they are reminded every time that they have a choice for E85 fuel. We think this is really going to build a lot of interest in the part of customers on that important Yeah, just fuel. one quick point, sorry to interrupt, but the uh, people are sitting there saying, well, okay, maybe you, you, can you can manufacture the fuel from different sources, but you have the automobiles to use it, and the point is the technology is already advanced. I mean, they're out there, people on the road using it. So the question is now, can we get the fuel manufactured close to where people are driving flex fuel vehicles or vice versa so that we can get this technology expanded throughout the country. Go ahead. So, and, and on that pathway, one of the nice things we offer is with OnStar, a GM technology, all you have to do is push a blue button in your car and it'll tell you where the nearest E85 pump is mm -hmm. for you. So we're going to help our customers find the E85 as we work with governments and retailers to provide more E85 pumps around the nation. One of the nice things about a fuel like E85, it's also a bridge to a hydrogen. In fact, the beauty of hydrogen is it can come from so many different pathways, including renewables like E85. And when you use hydrogen with a fuel cell, fuel cell is like a battery. It creates electricity. As long as you have hydrogen available, it can create electricity. So you don't actually plug it in and recharge it. You right. refill with hydrogen. Right. It emits just water. It doesn't create any carbon dioxide. And it's twice as efficient as a gasoline engine. But even better yet, from our perspective, it's simpler. It has one-tenth as many moving parts in it as a gasoline engine, which is a big deal for the engineers developing the product. We think that's the key to making it affordable. And that affordability then is a pathway to high volume sales. But I think even beyond that, you recognize only 12% of the people in the world own an automobile. We think hydrogen and fuel cell technology can actually allow us to reinvent the car and make it even better and grow our business dramatically. So we see this as a business growth opportunity for automobile industry and for the energy industry. We're making great progress with the technology. We believe in the next five to 10 year time frame, we will have a fuel cell system that can compete head to head with a gasoline system. That's right. And, and we're spending $1.2 billion over a five year period on our 10 year period for hydrogen research. Uh, I, I, I would warn folks that I think the uh, hybrid battery and the ethanol uh, technologies will precede hydrogen. Hydrogen is a longer term opportunity. It's going to take a while for hydrogen automobiles to develop plus the infrastructure necessary to make sure people can actually have convenience when it comes to filling up your car with hydrogen. But nevertheless, I'm pleased to hear that GM is like joining the federal government on the leading edge of technological uh, change. The important part about that battery, too, is it's a stepping stone to the fuel cell vehicle. We will imagine our fuel cell vehicles will have some form of storing energy because as your car slows down, you want to capture that energy and store it. So it's not like we're making one investment here that doesn't help another one. They all, they all come together. The ethanol, the batteries, and the fuel cells are really one and the same roadmap to, to get to the future that offers a lot of alternatives for our nation. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Patty Stolt. Good morning, Mr. President. You've got an interesting business. I, I do, thank you. I What's blend it? ethanol for a gasoline refiner. You blend ethanol for a gasoline refinery. Would you take me to tell you about it? I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> don't act, please don't ask me to tell you about it. <laughs> I, I've been involved in the ethanol industry for over 20 years. I grew up on a farm in Yuma County. I need to point out that Yuma County is the number one corn-producing county in the nation most years. I'm a fourth generation. 
number one corn producing county in the country? It's in Colorado. Really? We grow a lot of corn, about 30. It's not what they told me in Iowa, but that's all right. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I'm a fourth generation member of my family that's been committed to production agriculture. I started a company, ethanol management company, in 1984 to introduce ethanol to Colorado. A partnership with a small independent refiner, Frontier Oil and Refining, led to the construction of a blending and storage facility here in Colorado and the introduction of 10% ethanol blends. Frontier's willingness to think outside the box and our commitment to supplying quality controlled ethanol has been a successful combination for both of us. They expanded their barrel, agriculture expanded its market. Mr. President, the ethanol industry's growth has been remarkable. Mm -hmm. It took the ethanol industry 12 years to make the first billion, 10 years to produce the next billion, three years to make the third billion, and they increased capacity by a billion gallons last year. This kind of rapid growth means that supply and demand doesn't always grow at the same rate. And there's going to be times, like today, when ethanol's demand, ethanol supply isn't quite keeping up right. with supply with demand, I'm sorry. But right now, there are 31 brand new plants under construction. There are nine existing facilities that are expanding, and the ethanol industry will quickly catch up. I believe the ethanol industry is right on target to meet the demands of the Energy Policy Act. But producing ethanol from cellulose has the potential to greatly increase that volume. I believe corn-based ethanol production can serve as a basis for, for the development of cellulose foundation. Mm -hmm. I get really excited thinking about biorefineries where you have corn-based ethanol, cellulose conversion, and they can provide fuel. I love a quote that Henry Ford did in 1929. Be careful with the GM guy there. You know? <laughs> I think he's going to like he's it He's open-minded. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Henry Ford said, and I quote, that we can get fuel from fruit, from sumac by the road, apples, weeds, sawdust, almost anything. He pointed out then that one, the, the ethanol produced from one acre of a field of potatoes would produce enough fuel to cultivate that for 100 years. The, he ended his quote with saying, it remains for someone to find out how this fuel can be produced, a commercially better fuel at a cheaper price than we now know. Mm -hmm. 77 years later, with the combined efforts of research and development, strong government leadership, strong agriculture, the ethanol production industry, and the cooperation of the petroleum industry, we can meet Henry Ford's challenge. We can be an important part of this country's ethanol solutions. I'd like to talk just a minute about agriculture, if I could. You got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Production agriculture, like most, most of America last year, was adversely affected by the hurricanes. We harvested a crop that was lower in value, partially because of the damage to the locks and dams, with fuel that was skyrocketing in price. Right. The market demand created for corn for ethanol was more important last year than it's ever been. Ethanol is now the third largest use of American corn. Last year, the ethanol cons industry consumed over 11% of the corn produced in this country. Ethanol plants are helping to boost rural communities by creating jobs, adding to the tax revenue, and creating business opportunities for the local businesses. I think that the Energy Policy Act of 2005 set the goals. We need to work together to make sure the rules and the regulations provide real benefits to rural America. Mm -hmm. We can make sure that the benefits of all the agriculture in rural America has to offer in renewable fuels, that we get some of those benefits to Main Street, not just Wall Street. Bottom line, ethanol works for America. We can become an important part of expanding and diversifying our energy supply while adding environmental benefits and adding to the strength of America and agriculture. Well said. Uh, our economy, uh, a strong economy is one that needs a good farm economy. Absolutely. And uh, the more markets there are for our farmers, 
the stronger the economy is going to be. And ethanol is just another market. And Mr. President, we really appreciate your support of this program. I, well, listen, I, it makes sense. Anybody who doesn't support it doesn't quite understand the problems we face. But thanks. Good job. You're a pioneer yourself. Thank you. Colorado's famous for pioneers. <laughs> Bill Fry, straight out of Delaware. Is that right? Straight out of Delaware. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Tell people what you do. Okay. I'm uh, involved in DuPont in looking at how we can take biotechnology to help to grow the corporation. And one element of that, and probably the biggest element that I deal with on a daily basis, is the, the work that we're doing in cooperation with NREL and others, looking at how we will make the vision that you've stated in the State of the Union around cellulosic ethanol as a commercially viable option. Uh, that's we, we spend a tremendous amount of our time, and I think that the relationship we have with NREL is a good example of what you talk about in terms of a government and corporate uh, partnership to help to make that thing ha make that happen. Are you dedicating a lot of dollars to research and development? I know you are in general, but how about to alternative sources? Of absolutely, energy? absolutely. And we're doing it in two regards. Most of the discussion so far has been around the issue of fuels as an output. We do a lot of work in terms of uh, using uh, cellulose-based or using corn-based uh, raw materials to make materials as well. So we're in fact about to open in uh, mid-year this year, the largest uh, aerobic fermentation facility in Loudoun, Tennessee, to make a material that goes into a fabric. And, and I think, Mr. President, you might have actually seen an example of that during your tour this morning uh, of a fabric that will be produced from corn. So in addition to fuel and the benefits that producing fuel has in terms of reducing the imports of oil, we're also looking at how we can do that in the material world, uh, where how there might be raw materials that we can derive from uh, plant-based sources. Good. Uh, let's see what I can ask you here. Uh, the, um, what is your relationship, what is the nature of the relationship with NREL? When you say you work with NREL, yeah. tell people how yeah. private sector and government entities, you know, interface. So everyone, if people have mentioned biorefinery, I think probably everyone so far has mentioned biorefinery. Hey, look, I said, I said it up front. Yes, you know? yes, of course. So, uh, so there, there, uh, we get together on a regular basis. The, the Department of Energy has been very helpful as well in terms of yeah. helping to, to uh, pattern this, this entire area. Um, we've made a lot of progress, and we're really looking forward to what we believe is the next stage, and that is to go to a pre-commercial project. So we're oh, great, in, in great discussions to look you at. You know, part of it's the process of converting the switch grass to fuel, part of it is to make sure the manufacturing product, product, process yields a cost-effective pro product, and that's a lot of what you're discussing, which is important. Right, right. And it, it's important, I think, also for a lot of the, uh, the constituents to know that, um, that there isn't an either-or situation as it relates to the type of work that we're doing with cellulose. There's some cu confusion at times as to is cellulosic going to take the place of corn-based ethanol, and of course it's not the going to do no. that at all. Course. We got plenty of demand. I mean, there's going to be a lot of cars. We only got four and a half million cars. What are there, 220 million cars in America? And by the way, just to make sure everybody's expectations are set, our, our fleet's not going to change overnight. It takes a while. When we get new technologies available at, for people to buy, hybrid vehicles or, you know, flex fuel vehicles, it takes a while to change a 220 million car fleet to a modern fleet. And so it's, what we're talking about is you know, an evolution, so that people don't have the expectations that overnight there's going to be millions of people driving, you know, hybrid vehicles. Or we want them to be. It's just going to, just from a practical perspective, it takes a while. Yes. Thanks. And I, I think, uh, you know, in, a, uh, in terms of the project and your leadership, Mr. President, we've been very happy about the push and the emphasis that you've given to this issue. It really is an issue that can be uh, can be solved. We can, in fact, make this happen. Uh, it's a question of the will to make it happen. So yeah, we're think, very happy. I think the nation, part of this deal today is to help develop national will. Most Americans understand the problems. And uh, and so, good. Thanks for joining. Good. You did a fine job. Tell them back tell them hello there okay. in Delaware. All right. I'm sure they're watching, so. <laughs> they're watching, well. <laughs> Give them a wave. Okay. <laughs> Laurie Vasil Vaslavic. 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 Uh, so you're an interesting addition to the panel, besides being a fine person. Tell people what you do. I think people find this interesting. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I'm Lori Vaslavic, and I'm the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity of Metro Denver. Uh, I know that you've worked on uh, Habitat Homes yes. as a volunteer, and that you and many people know that the mission of Habitat for Humanity is to build decent, affordable homes which are sold to low-income families. Um, but what most people do not know about Habitat for Humanity is that we are also building some of the most energy-efficient homes in the United States, and nowhere is that more true than in Denver, Colorado. The reason that Habitat for Humanity wanted to improve the energy performance of our homes, uh, well, there were three main reasons. First, Habitat for Humanity is currently building more than 20,000 homes a year. That's one home every 26 minutes. As one of the largest home builders in the world, uh, we believe we have an obligation to be uh, good stewards of the Earth's resources. Second, since our homes are sold to low-income buyers, uh, we need to ensure that they're affordable to own, right. not just to purchase. And uh, providing for low-cost utility bills is one of the primary ways that we can do that. And finally, we want to set an example for the home building industry that says that if Habitat for Humanity, as a nonprofit builder of affordable homes, can build energy efficient homes, then all home builders can and should. Uh, homes account for 37% of all U.S. electricity consumption, 22% of all U.S. primary energy consumption. So looking at how our homes consume energy is an important part of an energy plan. Uh, we've certainly all seen the impact that the high cost of uh, heating fuels has had on many of us this winter, and it's an impact that is especially severe on lower income households. In 2005, Habitat for Humanity and NREL came together to design and construct the ultimate example of an energy efficient home, which is a net zero energy home. A net zero energy home means that the home will um, produce as much energy as it consumes on an annual basis, the result being that it's a net uh, zero energy consumption. We start by making sure the home is super insulated, um, that it utilizes passive solar gain, uh, and then it incorporates solar technology. This home has a solar hot water heating system and one of those photovoltaic systems that provides um, the home's electricity. It is what you described in your opening remarks. That home is a power generator. Right. Um, the home, uh, the system is connected to the power grid so that the home can draw um, power when uh, it isn't producing enough, um, but also so that the home can return excess energy to the grid when it's producing more than it needs. Uh, the result will be a net uh, energy usage on an annual basis. So we're monitoring the home through the Building America program for a year. We have data on 50 days so far, which are the days including January and uh, mid-February. Of those 50 days, on six of them, the roof was completely covered with snow, so it generated no energy production. Nonetheless, the home produced 83% of the energy used, making us very optimistic that at the end of the year, we will show a true net zero energy performance. That's great. But Mr. President, I want to tell you the best thing about this house. In October of last year, the Habitat for Humanity net zero energy house became a home for a single mother named Amy and her two young boys. Uh, as a low-income wage earner, Amy thought the American dream of home ownership was out of her reach. But today, she's living that dream in a beautiful, warm, affordable, highly energy-efficient home. In addition to being able to afford her mortgage payments each month, Amy may be the only resident in the Denver area who opens her utility bill with excitement each month um, because she knows that it, too, will be affordable. This home is proof that today's technology can transform the way we live in our homes and the impact uh, that we have on our earth, which is the ultimate habitat for humanity. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well spoken. If anybody in the Denver area wants to contribute to help somebody's life be a better life, join Habitat for Humanity. I mean, it's if, if you want to... You know, the truth of the matter is, I was just thinking about, we're talking about power and power sources and everything. The true power of the country is the hearts and souls of citizens who volunteer to help uh, change people's lives. So thanks. Thank you. Beautiful statement, using some technology to help somebody. But you're right, the, the great source of inspiration is the fact that we've got a new homeowner. Absolutely. Yeah, that's neat. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Dale, step forth. <laughs> I'm here, sir. Good. Reporting for duty. Uh, are you gainfully employed? I am. <laughs> it, as long as you're kind to my boss. <laughs> as long as Congress quits earmarking. Anyway. Uh, well, well, we could talk about that, too. Yeah. 
Uh, I am here at NREL, but I directly support the hydrogen program back at the Department of Energy. Great. And as you pointed out just a few minutes ago, uh, uh, the hydrogen program is our long-term strategy for energy security and, uh, and environmental security here in the United States. You know, biomass and solar and wind, we have a foothold in the portfolio already. Hydrogen, we don't for two main reasons. One, there's, there are significant R&D challenges. We have research and development we have to do to make sure that we understand how to implement the hydrogen economy. And then secondly, this is a game changer. Yeah. It's a game changer because we're going to have to put in a whole new infrastructure. Think of the gasoline infrastructure we have today that we've built up over, what, 100 years. For hydrogen to be our transportation fuel, we have to begin to replace that. So that's why three years ago, in your State of the Union, you announced the Hydrogen Fuel Initiative. And if you would like, since you probably don't get a briefing every morning on that, I'll give you an update on, on what we've done in the last three years uh, in that effort. Thank you. First of all, this, this is a huge program in terms of not just the federal government, but working with our partners. We have today over 300 research and development demonstration projects going on across this country, with the best minds in the country working on these programs. 200 large and small businesses, 80 universities, mm. 40 uh, institutes, professional associations, and 20 laboratories, such as NREL, ac across the country, all contributing to this effort. The, what we're trying to do is to, by the year 2015, have proven these technologies with our partners such that industry can then say, we've got it from here. Because in the long run, it's not the government that's going to implement this hydrogen economy. It's going to have to be the industry partners that you see here at the table. So like if you've got a two-year-old child, when the person gets to be 12, maybe thinking about driving a car, all of a sudden the technology becomes more real. Pretty close. For a guy 59, is, you know, <laughs> 10 years is a lot. <laughs> if you're two... It's not all that much. <laughs> it's conceivable that a two-year-old today could be taking a driver's test in a hydrogen-powered automobile. Keep going. So here's what we're doing. The, the major technological challenges, I, I can boil them up into three areas. There are many, but, but here's a good way to think about it. The first is production of hydrogen. You know, hydrogen, even though it's the most common element in the universe, here on Earth, it's not yeah. found freely. It's bound up into these larger molecules, and therefore it takes us energy and dollars to break it free. So that's, that's the main thing. One reason why we need to expand nuclear power is to be able to help manufacture ample quantities of hydrogen to help change the way we live. That's exactly right. We can take that electricity from a nuclear power plant, electrolyze water, which just means break the hydrogen free from the oxygen, and then have it for a fuel source. So production is, is one of our big goals. And the goal there, of course, is to make the cost of the hydrogen competitive with right. gasoline today. Otherwise, you and I won't want to buy it at, at the uh, filling station. Correct. The second area is storage. This is really an interesting one. <laughs> because hydrogen is such a, the, uh, the simplest element, it has a complexity that affects us in terms of using hydrogen in vehicles. We have to be able to put hydrogen in a tank, just as we do gasoline. Well, because it's so light and its yeah. density is so low, it's really hard to pack enough of it into a tank that's not the size of your whole trunk, such that we can get 300 miles down the road. And for Larry to sell a car to one of us, we want to go at least 300 miles or more, especially yeah. when you're driving in Texas, a long way between filling stations. Yeah, we want more than one seat in the automobile. <laughs> So the ways, the ways that we can uh, store hydrogen today are by compressing it, high pressures in tanks up to 10,000 pounds per square inch, or liquefying it, yeah. making it very, very cold. Both of those are intermediate options, but they're not good options in the long term. So we have, we have established three centers of excellence in this nation. In fact, NREL is one, looking at new, novel, breakthrough technologies, substances, carbon, for example, hydrides, that can absorb, adsorb the hydrogen, mm -hmm put it into a small area, and then release it out of this tank, if you will, to the fuel cell when it's time for you to drive your car. This really needs a breakthrough. And in fact, it's the area that's getting the most attention with the dollars that you're sending over to the hydrogen program. Lastly is the fuel cell itself. If we, if we can produce the hydrogen, get it into a tank, and then get it up to the fuel cell, that fuel cell has to produce electricity. We have to make that fuel cell cost effective right. so that it's about what Larry would charge for a gasoline internal combustion engine, and on top of that, durable. 
We don't change out our internal combustion engines all that often in cars anymore, do we? We go a long ways. So we want to have the fuel cell, which is essentially the replacement for that engine, to have that same durability. 5,000 hours is our goal by 2015, and we're already up to about 2,000 hours in making great progress. So that's what we're doing. Our partnerships with industry are huge. We have a partnership called the Freedom Car and Fuels Partnership. Yeah. You've heard of this. The three uh, major yeah. U.S. car companies, the five major U.S. energy companies are all part of this. They, that partnership helps guide this research to make sure that as we produce these technologies, and we throw them over the fence to industry, they're implementable in this infrastructure that we have to develop. In fact, Larry is the co-chair of the executive steering group of that, uh, of, of that whole uh, mm. partnership. Uh, we also have just formed, just formed up within the last year and a half a new partnership with utilities. And we call it the Hydrogen Utility Group, HUG. In fact, Excel is a member. <laughs> and you might ask, well, what, what <laughs> what do the utility companies have to do with hydrogen transportation? Hydrogen is, is not just a fuel, it's an energy carrier. Think of it like electricity. Electricity is the way that Pat moves energy around our country today. Hydrogen can be that also. Yeah. And utility companies are getting on board, understanding that this is, that as we implement this infrastructure, it's going to have a fundamental effect on the way we look at energy uh, Energy, uh, so you've been looking at this for three years. Is this like science fiction? Or are we talking about something that you think will come to fruition? This is going to happen. Yeah. It's, 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 it's going to be exciting, out. It's it? going to be out in the middle of the century. It's not. It's not going to be something that's going to happen in the, in the next uh, 15 or 20 years. Right. But it's going to be the way our kids and our grandkids view the energy uh, structure of our country. It's very uh, exciting. In work. 1981, I don't think anybody ever thought there'd be such a thing as email. Matter of fact, we're still writing letters longhand, if I recall. Uh, typewriters were, you know, kind of. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Now it's computer. I mean, it, uh, it's amazing what research and development uh, can do to the way we live. Uh, you know, pay phones to cell phones in 20 years. I think what we're hearing is change of lifestyle in incredibly important ways. Uh, and the research is taking place. You can't have, we, we live in an instant gratification world, you know, so we've got to be, we got to be wise about how we make investments. Part of the strategy is intermediate term, part of the strategy is long term. And thanks for explaining an important long term strategy. You do a fine job. Can I boil it down, simplify it? Point one, two, three. I heard what you said today. That was good, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your work on that. Finally, Pat Vincent, the president and CEO of? Public Service Company of Colorado. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. You have a vested interest in all this? I do. I do. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to tell you about it. I want to talk about three things today. The first is our wind source program. And then the second is two partnerships that we have here with NREL. Okay. First, let me, before you start, sure. what is the main source of your power today? It's a mix between coal, coal. and natural gas. Right, right. We 50, have some 50. nuclear in Minnesota. Depends on the state. Here in Colorado, it's predominantly natural gas. And what states do you cover? Um, we cover 10 states. Okay. We cover the panhandle of Texas. There you go. We do. Oklahoma. People paying their bills down there? They are. <laughs> they are. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Fine part of the country, I want it you is. to know. Anyway, okay. you don't need to name them all. Okay, but you, Texas, Minnesota, there. yes. Yeah. Ten states. And you're based where? I'm based here in Denver, right. and this is our largest utility company here is gotcha. in Colorado. Okay. And we have uh, a wind source program that's been around since 1998. And what that does is allow customers to voluntary buy, voluntarily buy wind from yeah. us. And they can buy it in blocks. They can buy up to 100% of their power needs uh, if they want to. And we serve about 30,000 customers on that program. And it's not just residential customers. It's business customers. Right. You know, IBM, Air Liquide, uh, the account manager's favorite customer, New Belgium Brewery. Yes. Is, also a, um, is also a customer. And it has environmental benefits. We reduce the, the carbon dioxide for about 100,000 tons a year. But it also gives consumers a good feeling. And we have the greeny seal so that they can trust it. And it comes from two wind farms here in Colorado. Really? Because there's a lot of wind here in Colorado. Yes, there is. So um, it, it's a great program. And through your leadership also in extending the production tax credit, right. we just announced on our system 
that we're going to add more than 250 percent more wind on our system by 2007. Mm. So. so like when you analyze the wind turbine technology, is it, uh, is it advancing rapidly? Is there more advances to be made or am, are you out of, am I getting you out of your lane here? No, it's advancing rapidly and what we're finding is like Nan talked about the demand for solar is that the demand for the turbines is starting to outstrip the supply. Mm -hmm and a lot of it's going overseas. The production tax credit really helps us here because it kind of goes in boom and bust cycles. Mm -hmm. So that has really helped us levelize the demand mm -hmm. and make them commercially feasible. And people like GE are making big strides in wind technology. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, second programs we have are with NREL, and we have two. And the first one is a wind to hydrogen program. Mm. And I don't know about your experience with wind, but it does blow intermittently here in Colorado. And it does in Washington, too. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it blew all the time or just intermittently. Yeah, well, <laughs> lately all the time, yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 that's a challenge for us in generating electricity for wind. So what we're looking at with NREL is if we can then take hydrogen, store it, and use it to produce electricity mm. later. And we're also at the same time exploring whether or not it makes more sense to use it as transportation fuel. So we're going to take a look at the economics of that. And the main challenge on wind is that variability and the inter intermittency of it. Yeah. So this is a big deal to move wind forward another step. And the great thing we like about this is it's not going to just be tested here and then dropped. We're going to be able to take the test system that we have and redeploy it on our system. Hmm. So it will actually go into commercial operation when the testing is done. That's great. And then finally, and we talked about photovoltaics, and I like to say PV because it's much easier. Um, we're working with NREL on a program that talks about where the best place to site those PV panels. Mm -hmm. And NREL has a, a, a planning model here that looks at solar, looks at land usage, customer ownership, and then we can take and overlay the data we have in our mapping systems that talks about loads, where customers are, and put those two together and figure out where the best place for the solar panels are. And what Dan had mentioned... You mean regionally, neighborhood-wise, or specifically on the house? Even down to a building or a house. And we can tell, for example, in places where there's low population but high peak, we can shave the peak so we don't have to build peaking plants. Yeah. And we're also you might explain that to people, high peaks. Um, peaking plants are when normally there's just a base load of energy, and then when it gets real hot in the summer, everybody turns people their air conditioning on. People use it all on. at the same time, right? So it's a peak. And therefore, you want solar energy to help deal with the, the peaks. spikes. Yes. Yeah. And we don't have to build new power plants. And one of our other jobs at public service company is to open up the market for solar. So we offer rebates to, to customers when they put mm. solar in. And so that will help stimulate the market here because what Dan was talking about is a lot of the solar panels are going overseas, so we want to make sure our market here is just as vibrant and robust so that the solar panels stay also here. stay in the United uh, by States. By the way, uh, this may interest you, if you're you, these uh, people manufacturing photovoltaic pro uh, products I can't make enough. I mean, the demand for these things is huge, and uh, there's just not enough capacity. The plant we were at yesterday is going to double in size. Uh, they're making neat roofing materials, by the way. You know, I'm not their marketing guy. I'm just, <laughs> just, just happens to be on my mind. Uh, what's interesting about the discussion is the utility industry needs alternative sources of energy in order for them to be able to do their job. Yes. I think that's what you're saying. Yes, and it's good for our customers. Absolutely. It's well, good for the communities. It's good for us. Absolutely. And our shareholders. It's good for your customers. It's good for you. Yes. And I know you feel that way. Yes. Managing peak electricity loads with alternative sources of energy makes a lot of sense. Yes, it does. Good. You did a fine job. Thank you. Uh, so that's, that's, that's why we're here, to talk about a variety of options to achieve a great national goal. And there's no doubt in my mind we're going to achieve it. And it's exciting. It's exciting times to be involved uh, with all aspects of this strategy. And uh, you heard some of our fellow citizens describe to you what they're doing to be a part of this giant effort giant effort to change the way we live so that future generations of Americans will look back at this period and say, thank goodness there was yet another generation of pioneers and entrepreneurs willing to think differently on behalf of the country. Thanks for coming. God bless. Good job.